Hi, everyone. Good evening. Uh, I think we're we're underway. Yeah. <laughs> um, hi, everyone. Good evening and welcome. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I'm Sean Gasper Bai, a translator from Polish and a member of the Translators Collective, Sedilla and Company. We're delighted to be collaborating with the Center for Fiction to bring you this monthly series, and we're grateful for the Center's support. These translation clinics are intended as knowledge sharing open sessions for translators and lovers of translation from all backgrounds and experience levels. Each month, we invite a different literary translator to present on or discuss a subject of their choice with a Sevilla member, followed by a Q&A with attendees. Topics may range from questions and theories of craft to submissions, contracts, and other practical concerns, always with an eye to literary translation as a profession. Attendees are encouraged to bring questions from their own practice. These sessions will be recorded and available for later viewing. Live captioning is also available. You can click on the CC button at the bottom menu for various options. We invite you to turn your camera on if you like and settle in for the conversation uh, during which everyone except Rajiv and myself will be muted. Feel free to add comments and questions in the chat, which tonight will be moderated by Sevilla member Heather Cleary, a translator from Spanish. For the second half of the session, we'll open the conversation. If you're comfortable speaking on screen, raise your hand either by clicking at the bottom of the participants list or by using the reactions button. And you'll be invited to unmute your microphone and ask the question yourself. Or if you prefer Heather to read your question, please send it privately to Sedilla in the chat. We'll try to get to all of them, but we apologize in advance if we run out of time. For those who are unable to attend our live events, we encourage you to email questions or comments before or after the session to translation clinics at Center for Fiction. Uh, we hope to make these conversations ongoing to include viewers in as many time zones as possible. Uh, and now that that's all out of the way, let's dive in. Tonight, we have the tremendous good fortune to hear from Rajiv Mohadir. Rajiv is a poet and the translator of I Even Regret Night, Holy Songs of Demerara by Lalbahari Sharma, which received the Penheim Translation Fund grant and the 2020 Harold Morton Landon Translation Award from the American Academy of Poets. Currently, he's an assistant professor of poetry in the MFA program at Emerson College and translations editor at Waxman Journal. His book, Anti-Man, A Hybrid Memoir, is out next week from Restless Books. And tonight we're going to be talking about the strategies of deviant or queer translation. Rajiv will pose questions that think on translation as trialogue. What happens when the translation resists stability and when the speech community uses at least three different languages that have their own approaches to meaning making, vocabularies of humor, and social power? Can a queer method of translation produce change or inflect the violences of moving a language from periphery to core? How can a practice of translation account for slippage of meaning, resistance to fixity, and social slash power distance? Um, those are some pretty big questions. And Rajiv, I know you've been, uh, you've been asking these questions specifically in relation to your current translation project, or I, I suppose we can sort of call it a transcreation project. Um, um, so, uh, why don't you tell us a little about what you've been working on? Yeah, great. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Sean. Thank you to um, Sedilla and company for asking me to be here and to the Center uh, for Fiction, um, to Thierry, Heather, um, and Allison, as well as our captioner tonight, Bernice Bonilla. Um, I'm so excited to be here with you folks talking about this weird project that brings me a lot of joy. Um, you know, in these strange days that we find ourselves in. Um, you know, I began with this idea, this question of what is queer translation? I mean, it's pretty, um, it's pretty, it sounds pretty basic, but there's so much to detangle here. I mean, because I think of queerness as I see it as a way to locate the, the non-normative um, sexual practice and non-normative in the whole kind of um, ways that we are assuming, you know, thinking of Foucault, etc. But then also to think about like the aesthetics of this, the uh, affective reservoirs that uh, queer folks have to draw from and which I intend to draw meaning from. Um, it's also, uh, you know, this kind of act for me is what I call the practice of non-normative survival or deviant survival. Um, and I'm applying this to my whole idea of 
translating these multiple texts, triangulating them between um, multiple languages to bear the, the, the many nuances and that each of these uh, languages carry in terms of their worldview. Um, and I'm going to get to some examples in just a minute, but before, before that, um, you know, there are thinkers who've been puzzling through ideas of queer translation that I've been inspired by, um, you know, uh, one of which is uh, Nir Kadam in, in their article, What is Queer Translation? Quite literally. And this is a, you can find this online, it's a free download, um, and it's a good one because the, the author asks about locating the queerness in the translation. Is it a method or is it a product? Um, the, the, the author asks, does it imply that one is firstly a translator who then translates queerly, or that one is already queer when one begins to translate? Most importantly, what difference does it make and for whom? Um, and I like that idea. And then also thinking about, well, does it just mean that, um, you know, the, the, what is being translated is that uh, written or understood or performed by um, something that's queer uh, or someone or, a, uh, you know, an entity that is non-normative. So for example, like, uh, you know, the, 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 the oral tradition, the ephemeral, how can that then be translated? Um, which is kind of my object here for deviant translation. Although, um, you know, I'm basing this on recordings and I'm, I'm gonna get to that in just a second. But another thing that I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about through this deviant translation as an act um, is that it resists a binary sense of arrival and non-arrival. Like there's no longer a target, but many targets um, with each translation that's performed um, you know, thinking through a different angle of meaning, whether that's in the Creole, the Guyanese Creolese, which you'll hear, which is English-based, um, or whether it is the Guyanese Hindustani or Guyanese Bhojpuri, which is another kind of mm, Creole. The actual word is, a, it's a coinized language, a coin language, meaning um, that it is developed from many North Indian languages, as well as um, South Indian languages, um, languages of African descent in the Caribbean, um, as well as um, Dutch and Portuguese, etc. Um, and so, you know, I, I I think about this as like a practice of poetry that my my own familial community practices, um, whether it's in interpretation or uh, through interpretation of song, or if it is kind of like conveying any kind of sense of. Um, uh, the poetic. And so, uh, you know, and, and and talking specifically about oral culture, culture that's also like performed in many ways through dance, through um, other kinds of joy. And I'm going to be sharing my screen with you and I'm going to give you an, a, some, a sample of the things that I've been translating. So I've been translating these Chutney songs uh, originally written in Guyanese Bhojpuri, or excuse me, Sarnami Hindustani, um, which is a language that's spoken across the river from where my dad grew up. And so Sarnami Hindi and Sarnami Bhojpuri is a very are very, very close in their histories to um, Guyanese Hindustani, which is the language that I translate into and out of. Sarnami is not the language I, 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 um, I actually, I, I, you know, you can speak it if you do speak Guyanese word for you. Anyway, um, I'm going on too long. Ramdeo Chaitao, he is uh, a singer of this song called Rat Ke Sapana, and he is the Sarnami singer. Um, and this is one of the songs that I think about um, as being deeply rooted in my own kind of understanding of self, ethnicity, culture, etc. Um, and uh, as and, th and this came out in 1980, um, there's another version of this that was pr uh, uh, produced and sung by Babla and Kanchan, who took the song from the Caribbean back into India, repackaged it and produced it, and it proliferated across the, the Indian diaspora um, or South a the Indian labor diaspora or the South Asian labor diaspora. The last version is a co uh, contemporary um, Bollywood, uh, excuse me, not Bollywood, Bojiwood. So Bhojpuri film cinema's rendition of the song. But I'll play you the original to hear what it sounds like. Patta tute daar se ki le gaye paun uraye Yari bichure yaar se ye dukh hum se sahan jaye Raate sapna dikhaye piya hum ko Raate sapna ratiya sapna dikhaye piya hum ko So you hear the instrumentation, it's pretty, it's pretty boisterous. Um, there's a harmonium, there's a dholak, there's something called a dandatal, which is, um, you know, uh, it, it, it literally keeps a rhythm and it's like a percussive, like if you can imagine like a trap beat, it's like that kind of um, high pitched sound. Um, but that's not the version that most people dance to. This is a version that we know, um, if you know Ramdev Chaitu, but here is the version that 
Um, and uh, from there, I'm going to move into uh, just giving you a kind of like taste of what these translations sound like um, as I go from one language to another and into another and into another, um, thinking about accounting for the slippages. Um, and then, you know, I could get into later about the, the, the specific histories of the language and the intelligibilities and who speaks what and when they speak which language. Um, and so, you know, um, I lied a little bit when I was like, oh, primacy, blah, blah, blah. But just this is just this is a uh, this is my draft. You can see at the top here, it says it's like literally my draft. Um, these are the, the words that are written down, um, you know, and then uh, from there I go into the different translations. But I think I'm going to start uh, here. Actually, this is uh, modern standard Hindi. Vese mira sakha hamad mitra pan se nikal gaya. Mene ye khwab deka hai. मेरे घर के नजदीक कोई पेड़ नहीं मैं किसकी परछाया में बैठूं मेरे मायके में कोई वंशज नहीं मैं किस से बात करूं मेरे पिया का यहां में कोई कोई देवर नहीं मैं किसका हाथ थामूं फ्रॉम द ब्रांच टू लीव द स्क्वायर आउट मिनागो हेवल when mina get known friend so me been dream the yaad na get known country where me go sit my mama house me na get known by picky who me must stop us 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 me sasura me sasural na get day word de non bari na de ho hol me han e hamar aasa hai ke tu akela na hoy ई हमार आफत है कि हम अकेला रहब ई हमार आफत है कि तू अकेला ना होए ई हमार आशा है कि हम अकेला रहब ई हमार आशा है कि तू अकेला ना होए ई हमार आफत है कि हम अकेला रहब आशा वर्सेस आफत व्हिच प्रोसीड्स द अदर hope and pain so simple the word substitution like a body possessed of spirit one incarnation another incarnation which courtyard which tree only gaps then gasps imin fase how me punish you been go what gone from ya I don't get none kind mind for do nothing. I see the whole place empty for so. You gone and I get none place for me to run. I my back not there. My bike is picking not there. Not sa sa sur ni a few none body not there. So come so done. Me have to hold me own hand. You broke from my branch to fly. without you i'm lost to maya the store yard treeless shade and illusion join limbs to hammock the path what our mother father brother nephew but whispers of my own self in the next world what of relation saya whose is this hand whose is that hand um and this goes on for for ages and what i'm going to do is i'm going to stop there um and then i'm going to open up now to the questions that uh you know Sean and i will will be having in more of a discussion yeah so i i i thank you for sharing that with you i'm completely fascinated by everything about this project so you i feel like there's so many levels of like nonlinearity and like kind of deviance and deviation going on here so you're dealing with, first off you're dealing with primarily like oral texts rather than written texts right you're taking these songs that are that are popular songs that are also based in folk song and that kind of themselves exist in these iterative versions right and then you're producing your own iterative versions in three different languages that exist 
simultaneously kind of alongside and on top of one another and that have kind of a, a complex social relationship to one another. Um, and then of course you yourself have this sort of personal non-linear relationship to the song, to the languages, um, and of course to the translations themselves, which then kind of fold back on one another and iterate and all these kinds of things. So I, the, the, this whole process is like, is, is completely fascinating to me. And I guess looking at, I, I, I'm gonna go back to something you said earlier, actually. So I, I think deconstructing binaries should be familiar territory to anybody in the queer community, hopefully. And so I guess my question for you is what, was it that you you were already thinking of trans, of translation in kind of through kind of a queer framework, and you came upon this project and thought, ah, this is an interesting place to implement these ideas, or was it that you were already playing around with this and went, oh my god, I'm looking at this through through a queer framework? Yeah, that's a really good question. Like, which came first, you know, the chicken or the egg? Uh, you know, in this case, it actually was. Uh, you know, uh, a, a music uh, that I had embodied in many different ways, whether through dance or singing performance. Um, and then also like through the, the the practice of, or like through listening to many elders in my community interpret these songs for me. Like, okay, it means this, oh, but it means this. And oh, when you say this word, it means this, the word, you know, sasural, it invokes this thing. Deva actually means second husband because like there's a relationship between the daughter or the, the sister-in-law and the brother-in-law that's kind of sexual, maybe not, maybe it's also like that of a parent. So like, I've been like, I, I had been thinking through all of these like ways and thinking about how to get through all of that. I felt as though, um, you know, I was boxed in thinking in terms of, you know, two or one target language um, that when I was like, well, what could happen? It was like really, really an experiment. And this whole manuscript and every, this, all of this thinking is really experimental for me, which, you know, thinking about the experiment, also makes me understand it to be queer. And then when I started to think about, oh, well, these translations are de-reformations and they're deviant, I was like, oh, that resonates with another kind of, you know, way of thinking of the world, which is like, that's queer. Um, and so it's like, I tentatively like uh, overlaid this kind of idea of queerness over what I had been doing. I mean, and I, and I think like, this is where, uh, you know, you, people who are, um, you know, more versed in, queer theory are going to probably quarrel with me. Um, but, you know, I was thinking, I think sometimes that, um, you know, the, the work that I produce will be through my own lens, which usually is kind of queer. So. Yeah, I mean, do you feel like you're, um, I wonder, do you feel like with this, with this work, you're trying to kind of create a creative representation of this very complex, very personal dynamic? Or are you are you trying to make a new one? Are you trying to build a new, like non-linear relationship with these texts? Yeah, that's that's this is really interesting because like part of the the like reiteration and the changes, that is also much in line with the way the folk or in way in line um, with how the, the the songs developed and how they're performed. You know, the lyric fluidity through each performance um, is so great that it changes. Um, with each performer, you know, and I think of like timbre of voice and I think about like situation, I think about instrumentation, maybe the dolak is actually tuned to a different kind of note um, that mm -hmm. happens and whether there's a harmonium or not. And so like, I think that, I mean, it's weird to say that it could be part of a tradition. I mean, the, the, the thing that I've done is I've kind of lifted it out of that, you know, performance, the space of performance, which is, you know, folks sitting around together and put it onto paper, um, you know, which says something about, you know, my own state of isolation now. Um, and I think I'm just kind of skirting the answer to your question. Um, I think that I, that will be my answer. It's like, I, <laughs> <laughs> I think it's, it's probably a tricky thing to pin down. I suspect you're kind of doing all of the above. I mean, I get something else I'm really interested in is that like, so this is a whole project about orality and about fluidity and about physicality, which I will get onto in a bit. But, um, you know, writing the printed word, you know, has throughout all of human history has had this like this weight and like fixity about it um and particularly when it comes to particularly when it comes to 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 primarily oral languages like i'm really interested in the relationship between a creole language and the written form you know you have to pick a way that this language is going to look on the page and then kind of freeze it in place there so when you're when you're doing that in the context of a project that's about fluidity and non-arrival and dynamism 
how do you decide where that that little freezing point is going to be? Yeah, that's it. It, it is an inherently violent act, right? In this mm-hmm. in ex- colonial violence, um, you know, taking it out of the performative um, in, and and changing the actually changing the discursive space of the performance. Um, you know, like you're right about that. The book, the technology of writing, has been used to oppress um, uh, oral tradition. And so what does that mean for me? I think the thing that I am interested in is the way that these songs work for someone in my specific position. And this is where it becomes so like, am I doing this for myself? Maybe. (laughs) Because I think about that, uh, you know, it brings me joy to have it on paper and to say like, oh, how far can I actually push this line? Or, you know, how would you say this thing? Or what is the moment of levity here that I can extract and kind of build around? Um, and it's only after I see it on the paper, because my mind is lazy in that, like, I need, I, in order for me to hold on to, to information, um, and especially literary information, it has to be written down. You know, that's just, I've, I've been educated in the system, and that's how that works. So this might be my own kind of um, nostalgia for that, but then also playing into this older form of um, the, the performance of the songs changes actual physical space. And maybe this is one of those incarnations of that physical space that has Mm. changed also through time. Mm. Well, I I thought that's a great transition onto, I I really did want to ask you about physicality because I mean, you, you, when we were talking before about this, you were talking about, you know, these are music dance to, you talked about, you know, your own experience hearing these songs played in queer environments and like how that kind of changed your relationship to them. But I'm really interested in how you, you root your, your translation or you root your practice in, in physical experience and physical pleasure. And that for you, that's a very clear avenue of queerness in your work because for you, physical pleasure and queerness are, are inseparable from one another. Um, So how, how, how does that come into play in, in, in this particular work? Well, so in, in this example I chose was one of the things that I really love. So I get a lot of, I derive a lot of pleasure from sound and music and language and definitely writing language. I love the fact that Devanagari does not use Roman lang- uh, Roman uh, letters, uh, which is cool. Um, you know, the, the kind of slippage of, uh, of play between Asa and Afat, you know, whether it's like, hope or pain. I mean, those are really, really big things. And I love the idea of that play between how those two things can can be like uh, the same in the song, uh, just depending on when, where and when you place it. And so that back to the physicality, you know, like, uh, like I said, these songs are things that I dance to. I mean, 1981 was when, um, you know, the Bubble and Kanchan version came out my whole entire life. I've known these songs or this song and this, these songs that I translated, um, you know, and the, the, the kind of enlivening um, and waking up that I felt when it was actually played. It was in Toronto the first time, actually I write about that, but I don't know. The, the, um, the first time I hear these kinds of like home songs, you know, or family party songs in like queer space, it was just kind of like, oh, I can be a whole person outside of the house as well as inside of the house. Interesting. And so then, you know, part of that also is about bringing that into my life as a poet and writer and translator. Um, how, um, you know, these songs, it's funny because I, 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 I've talked to uh, like several folks in my community who do like organizing work and I'm like, so, do you know, let, let's talk about these songs. And I think that people are mostly like astonished to think that, that there's any kind of literary merit to the songs, which they just see as dancing, right? Which makes sense. I mean, you know, in a way that like uh, in colonial pressure, systems like you know this kind of knowledge or this kind of poetry let's say or performance cultural production is denigrated to being low culture um, and that's that's something too like embodying the low culture puts me into you know more kind of alignment with my body uh, as I listen to the songs again and again um, and to see whether my my words satisfy or or not mm, mm, mm. And, and I feel like sort of taking low co- culture and embodying it and to use a problematic term or phrase, but sort of elevating it in the way this is, this is to me is a part of queer aesthetics, right? It's sort of the, the process of, of kind of dressing up and decorating and glamorizing and sort of, um, and I was thinking of the word travesty earlier today, that sort of like the literal dragging up in a way of, um, of, of popular culture. 
I think something else that, that keeps going through my mind as I think about this project is that, um, you know, queerness is so culturally specific and so culturally rooted. Um, and you're, you know, I think that part of what's going on here is you're, well, maybe I, sh I shouldn't speculate, but I guess what I'm curious about is what what is the queerness that you see in these texts? Do you feel like it's going to be, that queerness will be different for different audiences? And are you making any attempt to kind of account for that? Um, like, I, I don't want to frame it in terms of, you know, foreignization or domesticization, because I'm sure that that's not the way that you were thinking about it. Um, but, um, you know, you're, you, translation is inevitably taking something out of its culture, or is it in this context? Are you actually taking something out of its cultural context? Or are you rerouting it in kind of a different aspect of the same multilingual cultural context? I don't now. Now I'm now I'm just talking circles. But you, <laughs> no, I love that. I love that question because it's so true. I mean, like, you know, will like what what about it is queer? Where will the readers locate queerness in this? And you know, I say that it's in my own uh, jouissance, like my own kind of like mm -hmm. language based joy. Like when a line break just delights me, which is also like to say very colonized of me, right? I mean, whereas you know, in the original, maybe it's the realization of the rhyme or the way that, uh, you know, the, the the next couplet is revealed after, like, oh, where's the, where's, where's the stinger gonna go from this place? Um, it, there's that part of it as well that I think is, is, is interesting and queer and joyful. Um, and I wonder about that for, for my, for, for readers, uh, you know, and I think that like, like anything else in and with queerness, it's about, uh, you know, it can be, it, it's poten it, it has the potential to um, enliven some other kind of um, act of affective uh, way of being in, in the world that doesn't necessarily correspond one-to-one -one with any other. And so it's that slippage between that I'm really, I, I think about, um, you know, as I think about, you know, what these songs are so important to me, how to cycle them into my own life and into my own practice. Well, you know, they're not, they're gonna be changed and the change is gonna be so marked. Um, you know, is that a continuation of colonial legacy? You know, the fact that my first language is English, um, you know, as well as, you know, these songs now, um, I'm bending them to fit into this like, a uh, new context, and it's like, let's be real, like this context is ra rarefied in the United States, right? Who has access to poetry? Um, you know, it's definitely not the people who, um, you know, uh, who I come from. So, um, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting question. Mm -hmm. And I, um, I just have the, a question about that too, you know, like, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's uh, it's just past seven thirty, so uh, I'm going to open it up to audience questions. Um, as we move into the Q and A, we invite you to turn your camera on if you'd like. Uh, to repeat, if you're comfortable speaking on on screen, raise your hand either by clicking at the bottom of the participants list or by using the reactions button, and you'll be invited to unmute your microphone and ask the question yourself. If you prefer for Heather to read your question for you, just send it privately to Sedilla in the chat. We'll try to get to everyone's questions, but we apologize in advance if we run out of time. Uh, Heather, do we do we have any questions? We do. We have a question from Evan. Would you like to ask yours? Sure, I wrote it down. Um, how can a translator best grapple when an author queers the source language and that queering only makes sense in the source language? Like, would you add footnotes and endnotes or do you have any advice for me? Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Evan, for that question. Um, uh, Naomi Carlson, in her translation of Paul Torabuli's uh, uh, Cargo of Stars, does this. Um, that book has all kinds of language play in French. And um, the way that she migrates that into English is just, it's like the book itself is a masterclass in translation and how to do that. And so for me, I like to get those examples. Like, um, um, uh, Popov and McHugh translate some Ceylon called in, in a book called Glottal Stop. And I think like that's also another fabulous way of thinking about how language can, um, language play can be uh, done. I mean, I think like, you know, I tell, I, I like to think about it as, you know, well, what's, what kind of play is available in English? And then, and then, you know, step that up twice. And then you, you, you come into this like space of newness and, 
uh, that's what I'll say. And don't be afraid. I, I think like um, one of the things that I'm not afraid to do, and Creole actually allows me to do this, is the bleed over. Um, you know, like, well, what if the you know the original language also finds its way into um, the English translation in a way that uh, destabilizes? In the same vein, perhaps. I don't know. Does that make? Is that? Is that? Does that sound okay? I guess. I. I yeah. I. I I, that, that makes a lot of sense to me. I, I, am, I am curious, I mean, sort of building on that, like how much, obviously, like the things that we've been talking about are rooted in this particular project that you're working on, but um, do, you, do you see yourself using the same strategies and the same approaches for other types of text? Like, does this, does this work for prose? Does this work for nonfiction? Does this work for, you know, uh, for non-oral texts in the same way? Yeah, you know, like before I come up with an actual theory, I'm going to have to develop a, a, um, an experiment <laughs> that has like a rigorous <laughs> kind of, you know, uh, reproducible thing. Um, and, you know, I don't know. I think poetry is elastic enough or plastic enough that I could I can stretch it and get away with it in a different way than, you know, maybe the line of prose. Um, but that's something interesting to think about, uh, because as I go through, um, you know, and I think about this and uh, interpretation is well it's spoken but then when it's written down it might look like the paragraph yeah that's a really good question um you know and I, I have to say like this is something that like I didn't do originally with the the, the, the holy songs of Demerara I even regret night um you know there's a little part in the back of that where I, it was only after I was giving um a, a talk about it and then someone was like well why don't you have any translations into Creoles in the book and I was like oh my god so like on stage I was just like, okay, well, let me try this. And so I picked a poem and then I read it aloud and then I like translated it into Creole. And then everyone was like, oh my God. And so like, thankfully my publisher was like, yeah, you should definitely put part of that into the book. And I was like, hey, that's that's pretty neat. And that's where my, my thinking started to grow. That, oh gosh, like what if, what if I turned the volume way up on this? <laughs> uh, I. Do we have any more questions? We do, Alex. Would you like to ask yours? I would love to ask mine. Um, it's great to see you, Rajiv. Thank you so much um, for um, talking about this project. I have a lot of questions, but but uh, in the interest of sharing time, you've used the word slippage a lot tonight. And I realized that I maybe have an idea of what that means, but I wondered if, if you could say what you mean when you use that word. Is it a word that means something particular to you? Or is it a word that you would say has a particular meaning in the context of, of deviant translation? Um, I'm, I'm really curious to know. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you for this question. And great to see you, uh, Alex. Uh, I'm. Uh, I can't wait till I see folks again in person. It is so lovely. Uh, but yeah, thank you for this question. I mean, I think I use the word slippage um, to, to indicate the kind of meanings that are not necessarily translatable or migrated, uh, easily migrated from one worldview to another. Like, so I think about in, in Cre Creole is always the easiest example for me, Guyanese Creole, um, in that like so much of the way the language is used, um, you know, there, there's humor in it that is not actually exposed unless it's like enacted by voice. Um, and so that's one of the, 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 the things that I think about uh, how to convey that in the next iteration, for example. Okay, what is the humorous, you know, realization of this thing that just I, I just went through? And then, you know, how, how to move that again. And so then that brings up a whole new, um, you know, uh, structure of problematics uh, of what that, next language can communicate where the next language won't be able to and the original didn't as well. And so I think that's kind of what I mean, or the fact of, you know, when I say blue or, you know, orange, um, you know, I have an idea of what that is in my mind. And, you know, we, it's, it's like the whole like structuralist debate about, you know, is it, when I say flower, what do you think of when I say, you know, a flower doesn't fall out of my mouth, for example. And so that, you know, um, understanding, um, or the, the difference between our understanding those phonemes even is, you know, also a potential for that slippage. Um, plus, I think about it as uh, kind of like the pocket spaces where you find queers clustering together, um, you know, wanting to smash patriarchies and, 
you know, everything. And I, and I, and I think of like how to, how to exact, how to talk about that. And then also like a, there's an affective part of it as well. Uh, like, so when I talk about the first time I heard, you know, this kind of music in like a queer space, um, there's no way I can actually, there's no way I, I can actually uh, communicate that effectively um, unless I'm like, oh my God, I heard Roth case up in a, at the Caravana party in Toronto downtown. Um, and unless you also know the context of that song, I mean, if that makes sense. So I mean a lot of things that maybe I should like, that should be one of the, 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 the parts of my introduction because I think about um, introducing this kind of project and what are the, the, the key words that I wanna focus on? You know, deviant for sure is one, queer is another, but I like the idea of slippage and being very specific and precise with that. Another word that you use that I'm really interested in is violence. Um, and I think it's interesting that you, I mean, it, when in, in your description for, for the talk tonight, you talk about, um, if I, I'm going to misquote this now, but the violence not of moving a language from the core to the periphery, but the opposite from the periphery to the core. Could you talk a little more about that? How, how do you see that? Yeah, thank you for that. So, yeah, like, and especially. Um, I'll talk broadly first and then maybe specifically. So it's a, it is a colonial violence to say that the way to understand a text is to understand it through the colonial language. Um, and so that is a kind of violence, um, you know, uh, that is enacted, but the, 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 the question remains, does that mean that like translation needs to only be violent? And I think that like, maybe that's also like a queerness of translation itself in that like, while, certainly everything is violent. You know, we live in a white supremacist country where everything is violent, you know, our, our, our economies and all of that. Like even the, the fact of translation can enact that violence um, in a, a, depending on who and how. I mean, you know, it's really funny um, thinking about, uh, I like to sidestep this by imagining translation as, you know, one particular translation as being only one possible emanation from a text. Um, you know, which is why it's so important that, to me that um, my books are published bilingually when they are translation. So I can always like have the easy out. Maybe it's laziness. I don't know of saying something like, well, you can translate it too. This is just the way I did it. You know, that kind of thing. As though it, it, it kind of shows the life of the text and how it changes and changes. Um, like, uh, you know, Tofu is uh, someone who's translated again and again. And every iteration of the translations brings something new and enlivens the text more and more. Um, so that kind of thing. And so maybe then the, the, the violence that I'm thinking of is stasis. Uh, another one of those violences that I'm thinking about is like, in fact, moving something as vivacious and lively as a song, a dance song in popular culture and folk tradition into a repository um, of a book, you know? Um, uh, we, a lot of people were asking, well, and you know, even with four-way review, they, they, they just on Monday released um, a small portion of this, this uh, text, um, and I had been in conversation with Ross White over the, the last uh, semester, um, you know, as he is at UNC um, Chapel Hill, and I was doing this um, Asian American fellowship there, and we had been talking about, um, you know, where is the, the sound part of this? Where is the spoken part? Can we include that? And like, absolutely, but then like, I also now I'm like, well, should I make, you know, videos and um, you know, should I get a makeup artist? And what will my costuming be as I read these things? Um, and that's, you know, to be to be uh, considered fully. Um, and 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 it doesn't it doesn't change the fact of the violence. It allows it to be just one of the possible emanations. It's like, you know, you can't have anti venom without the actual venom. Is that the the whole like pharmacon idea? So I like that. I like that. Uh, do we have uh, do we have any more audience questions? We have uh, we have another few minutes here. At the moment, we do not. Um, but I hope you're all thinking about your questions, and we'll either paste them into the chat or or raise your hand. Um, I I guess I have one, unless you have mm -hmm. another prepared one. I just was really really um, really fascinated by your your description of slippage in your work and it got me thinking also about the your your practice of hybrid memoir and i was wondering if there's a way in which you 
um, think about the practice of translation and the practice of writing hybrid memoir in political and aesthetic terms as, as informing one another or what, what is their relation to you in your mind? Oh, that's a, that's a wonderful question. Thank you so much, Heather. Um, I, you know, I, there's a, to be quite open and honest, <laughs> the, the memoir was written piece by piece and it, I never thought of it as like a cohesive thing until I was like, actually, these are all talking about, you know, a specific seven, eight years of my life. Um, and then when I got to the place where I was like, oh, let me just see if I can weave them together. It was through the help of my editor, actually, that I was like, oh, this is how I can have like all of these pieces arranged to be um, to, to have an arc. But that said, I read this article from Electric Lit and they talked about how queer writers are coming up with queer genres. And I like after I read that, I was like, I think maybe I did that intuitively. And I didn't realize that that's what I was doing. Um, but, you know, I did I did love books like uh, Rolling the R's by um, R. Zamora, Zamora Lindmark, um, you know, which is, uh, you know, written in uh, Hawaiian Creole English uh, by, uh, you know, a poet and writer. And, you know, ha having that be kind of like a framework for my thinking, like, oh, what can I do to, to think about um, pushing the, the boundary? And so, you know, even with this memoir, you know, there's the, the, a similar approach that I have in this new translation or transformation or you know deviant project in that you know there's transcription there's translation there's you know um uh speculation um as well as like what you would imagine to be like just maybe linear prose um so yeah I mean these things are not unrelated uh, and for me I think like since my my my, my first thing is poetry it all kind of makes sense uh in that way that I really am driven from association to association in my actual poem. That, okay, yeah, what if that's like an approach? What if like everything I'm saying is just so simply mundane that the poets are just kind of like, you're just talking about poetry. Like, <laughs> don't, don't, don't get your wires crossed, so. Thank you. Any other questions from the audience? Uh, I, I guess I have another question, which is, um, you know, I, I, I remember you talking about how these are, you know, songs that you grew up with, that these are songs that you learned in, you know, at home was the word that you used in kind of a family context. Um, have you, have you shown any of this work to your family or to folks from home? What is their reaction to it then? Yeah. So, you know, uh, I love my family dearly. Uh, we are not the most literary family or literate family either. Uh, so I'll say things and I'll be like, oh, did you know this means this? Or look at this project that I'm doing. And the, the, the response that I usually get from my home, uh, my, you know, being that my, my mom, my brother, and my sister is who would be interested in this? Uh, and I'm like, well, I am. <laughs> and I'm gonna, God damn it, I'm gonna make other people interested in it too, um, just from my, you know, not being able to, to and the, the fact that I'm a dog with a bone here. Um, but you know, I mean, I, but, but it, it, it's beautiful in another way. So I got married in 2019 and, um, you know, uh, not, I don't, I don't have a lot of family, like, uh, family that I'm related to by blood that came to my wedding, um, for many reasons, mostly like, you know, reasons that you could expect. Um, and so, uh, you know, of the like five, six family members that had come to my wedding, um, the DJ had played one of these songs, one of these Japanese songs. and all of us were dancing together alone and it felt so intimate and so like, oh, this is my sharing my process with them, you know, because it felt really deep cutting because, oh my God, I'm gonna, I might not, cry, I might cry, so excuse me, but it was like how we weren't just in family space, but we were in queer family space, which is like a place I never thought that I would take my mother, you know, in her sari. <laughs> so. That was that was some kind of magic. Oh well, thank you for sharing that. Um, and I guess that's a good moment to transition to our final question here. So we've been asking this question to every one of our every one of our speakers, um, and the question is, what would an ideal future of literary translation look like to you? 
Ooh, yes, this is a great question. And I've been thinking about this since you sent me an email. <laughs> and I have like so many things that I want to say. I want to say that, you know, the future is multilingual. Books are in translated in, you know, many different languages, all in the same space. Uh, I, I think that it's like incredibly diverse. And I think that instead of like having like, you know, um, having more international presses, um, that actually have conversations with other international presses differently. Um, like Siegel Books is like an example that I, th I think of that's just incredible. Um, but again, they're located in three cities. What if there's like 20 cities and it's just, they're all related and that kind of thing. So that they're, the, the boundaries are more porous. Um, I also want to point out the work of uh, Sawako Nakayasu, um, whose uh, translations of uh, Chikasagawa are just mind blowing in the way that um, you know, Sawako kind of folds in Japanese into the English and English into the Japanese. And so what cre is created is something new. And that's kind of like what I'll say. I'll, I, I'll say that um, I'll vote, I'll vote uh, Sawako as the president. Uh, so that's it, I imagine. Thank you. Thank you. That's a great answer. I love that. Um, uh, and I guess that's all the time that we have for today. So thank you so much for joining us. And thank you again to the Center for Fiction for hosting these clinics. And thank you again, Rajiv, for joining us tonight. Uh, translation clinics take place on the third Thursday of every month. Please sign up to be notified of upcoming events. Uh, next month, Mui Pupoxical will talk with Julia Sanchez about how things work in, the, in publishing literary translation and what can be confusing about it, particularly for translators from languages with less systemic support, but also for those of us who do it all the time. Uh, the registration link is in the chat and on the Center for Fiction's website, and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Please stay safe.